Good morning, everybody. Great to have you on today's webinar for our Premier Investor Day. For the next two hours, we're going to have some great presentations that we hope will be valuable to you and bring you some insights across quite a wide variety of topics. For those of you who dialed in to the last two days for our multi-manager investment webinar, we hope that you enjoyed it, found it interesting, and many thanks for participating in that. So I'm going to be kicking off procedures today, just giving you an update on the Exchange Solution Fund of Funds for the first 20, 25 minutes, and then we will get into our various speakers for the day. We will try our best to stick to the time, and so we are hoping to be finished by 12 o'clock midday today. So let me get straight into our presentation. So it is on the Exchange Solution Fund of Funds, and I know that it's been a while since we've been able to give you a detailed update on these funds, so hopefully that's what I will be trying to do today. So I'm going to first of all start off by just going through the markets and market movements. We'll then go through some, I think, quite interesting points on the Exchange Solution Funds that uh, we've developed over the last six months or so because there have been quite a few changes within the funds that certainly we've been quite excited about. And then lastly, we'll end off talking about investment performance and how the funds have done and changes we've done in terms of our house view and asset allocation. So what's been happening really in the markets? This slide just puts up the market returns as at the end of July. So it was, it's just uh, a month ago. We've just had obviously August month end. But as at the end of July, if we look really, I think at the two key columns here within this presentation, the year to date column and the one year column. So year to date, if we look across the domestic asset classes, we see it's been a strong start to the year with all asset classes being up quite nicely in positive territory. So equities are up around about 18%, listed property also up 18%, bonds up 6% and cash too. If we look at the one year figure, it's been also an exceptionally strong last 12 months with again all asset classes very much in positive territory. So equities are up 28%, property 28, bonds 14, and cash about 4% or so. I saw the August month in figures came out last night, and I was quite um, pleasantly surprised to see, and I'm sure it was against everybody's initial thoughts, that listed property in South Africa as at the end of August for the 12-month period is now actually up 50% and was up a further 7% for the month of August. Looking at the global asset classes towards the bottom, so under the blue heading we have the figures in US dollars, in the middle part we have it in rands, so over one year in US dollars, again, massively strong markets, up 40% equities in US dollars, 36% for listed property, and bonds and cash basically flat. Over the year, you'll see in RAND terms, it's 15% and 12.5% and 8% for equities, property, and bonds. And the difference between the two returns, the US dollar returns and the RAND returns, is of course that currency movement between the RAND and the dollar. And we have seen that the RAND over the last 12 months has strengthened quite significantly because this time last year, it was post-COVID and we were sitting at very weak exchange rates. This slide we've shown you a number of times before, and we think this is really the important one, and this shows us the real returns across asset classes. So remember, this is taking inflation out of the picture, and we're looking at the returns that you've made over and above inflation, because for us to grow our real wealth, we need to keep up and ideally outperform inflation. So we're looking here at three, five, and 10-year periods, and we've got all the various asset classes here. If we start off with South African equities, over three, five, and 10 years, we see that it's given you around about five and a half to 6% real return, which is roughly in line with its long-term averages. If we took this graph a year ago, it was looking much, much worse 
But because of the strong returns that we've seen in the market, 30% or so we saw in the previous slide over the last 12 months, it's materially improved these real return figures. Listed property, which we would also expect to give us around about a 6% real return over the longer period. You'll see there over three, five, and 10 years, materially below that. Over three and five years, we're looking at about 12% negative real return. With inflation at around about 4 or 5%, that means nominal returns of minus 17% or so for the last three and five years, and flat for the last 10 years. So well below its long-term averages. Ironically, if we look the previous 10 years, which is 2000 to 2010, we saw the opposite with property. Property averaged about 22% a year for that decade. Bonds have been positive in South Africa, and it's largely also been driven because we know we've had a decreasing interest rate environment for the last investment cycle, the last six or seven years, decreasing interest rates, good for bonds, and we can see bonds has given you about 5% real return. Cash, 2% or so, also roughly in line with its long-term uh, averages. The star performers, I guess, have been the offshore markets, and specifically there we can see global equities the last three, five years has been extremely strong. Here we are showing it all in RAND terms, so it's including any RAND movements, and over the last decade, the RAND has net weakened to the dollar, and hence that will add to positive returns in RAND terms. So equities have been strong, listed property, and even government bonds that have gone sideways and are slowly, the market is starting to price in interest rate rises, particularly coming out of the, the noises that the Fed is making in, in the US. Uh, bonds have actually given us 5% odd real return the last three years. This was August month to date figures as of 10 days or so ago. Uh, we'll see there that again, August has been an interesting month, and as at the middle of the month was showing fairly positive signs, and when I looked at the figures again last night, they were actually flattish. Equities landed up flat for the month. Property landed up 7% positive for the month. Halfway through, we see it was up 2%, and the offshore markets also across all asset classes actually have added positive amounts. You'll see there the light green is the US dollar number, and where the green little circle is, is the RAND returns. During the month of August, the RAND weakened, along with most emerging market currencies, and hence the RAND return is above the US dollar return. If we take year to date what the South African equity market has done, it's round about up 18% as at the end of July. And we've plotted that here on the left-hand side graph. You'll see most of the returns happened in the first quarter of the year, where we made up virtually most of this, 15 to 18% of this return. And the last three months or so, the markets have gone up and down and been fairly volatile and largely moved sideways. Looking at that graph on the left, you would think that markets have been extremely volatile seeing this line going all over the show. The reality is, and we did some analysis, which we show on the right-hand side, if you look at the number of down days versus up days over the, the year to date, that seven-month period, it's actually very, very much in line with long-term averages. So you'll see there, 55% of the time we had up days versus the long-term average of 54% of the time. And we had down days, 44%, and up uh, versus the average of 46. So although things felt volatile, it was actually very much in line with long-term averages. This graph is breaking down the various sectors of the market. So you'll see there we're showing you the financial sector, the resources sector, industrials, and listed property. And I think the takeout on the left-hand side of, this, of the graph is really there's been no clear sector that's done consistently well over the, the, the first seven months of the year. We've had periods when financials have been running, we've had periods when resources run, industrials and property. And different times of the market and different times of the last seven months, different cycles and characteristics have been driving the market. 
So it's been really difficult as a fund manager to position your portfolios appropriately for a certain trend because there hasn't really been a particular trend in, the, in any particular sector. On the right-hand side, you can see that coming through quite clearly, where in July we saw industrials slightly down and resources up 11% for the month, but in August we see a reversal of industrials up 8% and resources flat for that month. So this is very much a good example of how the markets have been for the first seven months of the year. If we take a more global look, and we look here at the MSCI Developed Market World Index versus the MSCI Emerging Market Index. So the Emerging Market Index here is the dark green line, Developed Market is the light green line. You'll see there that for the first quarter or so of the year, Emerging Markets were flying and outperforming Developed Markets. And then around about March, April this year, things started to reverse. Developed markets continued their slow, steady increasing and climbing, uh, whereas emerging markets started to have a bit of jitters and actually have come down 8% since the end of May, whereas developed markets are up 4%. So there's been a 12% or so differential in performance between EM and developed markets. And that's largely really been driven, I think, coming out of the States, where the U.S. Fed has spoken about ending their low interest rate environment, starting to taper their bond purchases, and have indicated that sooner probably rather than later, they're going to start rising interest rates. Not, mass not massively and not very quickly, but a rising interest rate environment will be the first time in the U.S. for a while. So that's caused, first of all, a strengthening of the U.S. dollar, and also a weakening of emerging markets and emerging market currencies. All right, let's get on to now the Exchange Solution Fund of Funds. And I think the key point over the next few slides that I want to get across is that these funds over the last 6, 12 months have really changed quite materially. And even actually if we look over a longer period of time, the last few years, there have been quite a few changes within the funds, which makes for quite interesting uh, reading. So first of all, let's just start off with, with the size of this range of funds. So as at a, a week or so ago, the, the exchange solution funds were sitting at 5.2 billion rand. As you know, we have the three funds, the diversified, the guarded, and the accelerated. And in terms of the sizes of each of these three funds, as we can see here, diversified is just under 4 billion, the guarded funds a billion, and the more flexible non-REG 28 fund for, for non-pension fund and retirement money is, is, as one would expect, the smallest of the three, sitting at around about 250 million rand or so. What makes these funds quite interesting, I think, also, and stand out in the market, is that they have one of the longest investment track records for a fund of funds. We are this month hitting our 17-year investment track record with these funds. And as a range of funds, these funds still remain very, very important to the multi-manager team and are certainly a key area of focus for us. This slide, I think, is quite interesting, and it talks to a, a, a number of points, I think, and for those of you who are in the last two day sessions, we spoke about one of the trends and changes in the asset management industry has been on costs, and we know that there's been growth in passive investing, and this really sets out the TIC, total investment charge, for the diversified fund in this case, which is really our best biggest fund or flagship fund, but it would be the exact same story for guarded and accelerated. And we take it back really 12 years or so to 2008, and we see that the TIC in 2008 was 1.79, and as we stand here today, it's sitting at 1.1. So that's a close to 40% drop in the total cost on the fund to clients. This, of course, helps performance. Um, and is certainly beneficial overall to the clients, to the cost, to you speaking to your clients uh, in terms of what the fees are, etc. And we've managed to get this cost reduction, first of all, 
by introducing passive within the fund and also by negotiating better fees with our underlying managers. One of the other changes we've done in the fund is recently also is changed the split of the fund. So we've broken that up here in this graph and you'll see we've broken it into the Ned Group Best of Breed underlying fund percentages, what our passive holdings are via either the multi-asset funds or we also hold passive in equities, in bonds and property, and then our exposure to third-party fund managers, third-party funds being the likes of a coronation, a 91, a prudential, whatever it might be. And I think really the, the takeouts here, if we look at it, is if we go just four years or so ago, the best of breed funds made up 90% of our underlying fund exposure. Today, they make up just 43%. So they've more than halved, and that's really quite a fundamental shift in the way that we are approaching these funds. Uh, second of all, we introduced the multi-asset passive funds at a weight of 20% in the, in the exchange-guarded and diversified funds. And we've also introduced passive holdings in our bonds, in our property, and in our equities. So a very different graph on the right-hand side versus just four years ago. This slide talks to the passive exposure. You'll see here we've just broken it up into, first of all, the multi-asset passive exposure. Over the last three years or so, since we introduced it, we keep it at around about 20% or so of the portfolio. And then the green, light green line shows us the passive exposure when we include all the other asset classes like bonds, property, and equities. So you'll see there that the fund approximately is about a third in passive exposure as we sit, 20% in the multi-asset and about 15 or so percent across bonds, property, and equities. The other important area which clients I know are becoming now more aware of and which we've spent a lot of time talking about and we had a sustainability presentation yesterday uh, is the whole topic of ESG, environment, social, and governance. Now, this has very much been actually part of our process for a while now, but I guess like many other asset managers, we now put increased effort and emphasis on it. And it really falls in terms of our investment process in the whole manager research and portfolio construction of the portfolios. In terms of how does it fit in, as I think many of you will know who have been investors in the funds for a long, long time, is we are long-term investors within our portfolios and we stick with managers for a long period of time. We don't do many switches and when we do switch, we tend to stay then with those fund managers for a while. So when we are having our due diligence meetings with our fund managers, ESG now forms very much part of our process of discussions and it's an ongoing De debate and discussion with our underlying managers in terms of what type of research they're doing, what type of actions are they taking with the stocks that they hold in terms of an ESG um, perspective. I thought I'd put this slide in, which just shows another part of obviously what is very much our role as multi-managers, and that is in doing underlying fund manager research in speaking to our underlying fund managers, uh, which helps also from a research perspective, an asset allocation perspective, and I guess even now from a regulatory perspective where you need to show that you've done the required due diligence and research on your managers. This just sets out all of the underlying funds that we hold within the exchange solution funds and all of our exposures or meetings with these underlying fund managers over the course of this year. So you'll see we've broken it into quarter one, two, and three. Obviously, quarter four is still coming up. And so far this year, we've had 65 meetings and interactions with our underlying managers. You can just see there the number with each manager. And we, this is very much, again, part of our process. We make sure that at the minimum of twice a year, we have face-to-face -face meetings with the fund manager, and then we have additional interactions over and above that. All right, what changes have we made in the funds over the last 12 months? 
Some of this we have discussed with you, so I'm going to go relatively quickly here, but I would say the main changes have happened on the domestic equity side of the portfolio. I think from previous communications and presentations that we've given you, this has been the area where we were struggling. Some of our domestic managers for a while now had delivered underperformance, and we felt that we needed to take action here. So what we've actually done in terms of our domestic equity exposure is we've sold out uh, of our, the Ned Group Investments Rainmaker and what was the Ned Group Investments Value Fund. We used to have 65% of our equity exposure in those funds. That's gone down to zero. And we've introduced three other domestic equity managers, Lorium, Coronation, Top 20, and Matrix. And you'll see there we've introduced Lorium and Coronation as our main two domestic managers. The Lorium, as you know, were appointed as well on the Ned Group South African Equity Fund. And Matrix as well is a small boutique equity manager. We've also done changes on the property side. We uh, reduced our exposure to the Ned Group Property Fund. We held it, and you'll see there we've put our property underlying managers where we now use a portion, 30% into a tracker fund, 30% is with Ned Group, and Sesfakile, 40% allocation to our property expo exposure. Uh, on the offshore side, we've also made a couple of changes. First of all, we introduced Dodge and Cox. This is a manager that we know well. We invest with them in our offshore multi funds and have had money with them for about five or so years. And we've introduced them now via the Glacier Rand feeder fund into the Dodge and Cox fund as one of our underlying global equity managers. They are based in the US. They have a bit of a bias towards emerging markets, but also a, an excellent long-term track record. And then finally, we've added Africa uh, at just a small weighting, 2% through the Lorium Africa US Bond Prescient Fund. This is a US dollar denominated fund. It makes a part of your allowable 10% into Africa, and uh, that fund we've held for about four to six months or so. So how have the funds performed in terms of our underlying managers and overall fund performance? So if we start off over here, and again, let's just focus on year-to-date and one-year figures. The first slide here talks about our domestic funds that we hold. Uh, nothing majorly exciting, I guess, to talk about here. The core income and flexible income funds up 4% and 8% over the last year. The flexible income funds certainly done its job well again, enhanced type cash and flexible income mandate, 8% being a great return. The core bond fund, which is where we hold fixed income exposure, again, it's a passively managed fund, uh, also performed strongly. You'll see there are equity funds, Marzi, Ned Group Investments, SA Equity Fund, managed by Lorium, Coro Top 20 Matrix, and the passive Aussie Tracker, also all done quite nicely, up between 26, 30%, 24%, etc. The small mid-cap funds have been solid, as have our property trackers, all slightly under, outperformed or kept up with a real estate passive tracker. So overall, underlying managers have done pretty nicely for us. And I think that comes through, which we'll look at just now, in terms of the underlying fun, the, the fund performance. This slide focuses really on our offshore funds. In terms of our offshore funds, we've had money in the Global Flexible Fund managed by FPA. They've done really well, up 14% year to, uh, over the last year versus 4% of the peer group. And in terms of our offshore equity funds, the one area that's uh, struggled slightly has been emerging markets more recently, and you saw that slide earlier on where the last quarter or so emerging markets have underperformed and fallen a bit. So you'll see that coming through in, in the numbers. It is a relatively small holding within our, our global portfolio. And then our equity managers overall have performed quite consistently. And then lastly, the 20% in multi-asset passive has performed consistently and done very nicely and certainly added value to the portfolios. 
So how is that translated into fund performance? We've put up here the fund's performance over year to date in the last one year, which is really, I guess, the area we're just focusing on in terms of today. Uh, given all of these changes, given our, our slightly new approach, and I think overall we're pleased with the results. Year to date, the guarded fund is up 8.4% versus the peer group 7.4 and our inflation plus 3 target of 4.7. Diversified is up just under 12, slightly ahead of the peer group and the 6% inflation plus 5 target. And accelerated is up 13%. Over the one-year period, the funds are up 12, 16, and 17 and a half percent. So that's been, I think, a good outcome for clients, particularly having had three years of quite low returns before that. I've just put in here a couple of peer, peer funds. I could have put more in. The honest truth was I was struggling with the table to put an insert new lines and I couldn't uh, do it. So I had to just stick to the two lines that were in there. So I just chose really 91 and Alan Gray in the low equity and high equity space. Uh, and just to, you know, the guarded fund is up 11.7, pretty much exactly the same as Alan Gray, slightly ahead of 91 cautious on the diversified fund. We're up 16, Alan Gray up 16, 91, up 12, and on Accelerated, there are not many funds in that category. We're up 17 and a half, 361 was up 16, and Lorium Flexible was up 21. Uh, this I'm really going to go through very quickly. We do show you these slides. Really, over the a rolling three-year period, the guarded fund, 91% of the time, has been ahead of the peer group. The diversified fund on a rolling five-year period, 84% of the time ahead of peer group, and the accelerated fund over a rolling seven-year time horizon has had a 90% hit rate ahead of the peer group. This is our current asset allocation across the funds. I've really just put our neutral overweights, et cetera, in the diversified column. It would be consistent across all three of the portfolios. From a house view asset allocation perspective, we are neutral for local equities. We are overweight in terms of bonds and fixed income. We have been that for a year and a bit now since just post the COVID crisis. Uh, we reduced some of our overweight within that asset class. We've been marginally underweight to neutral local property. We've actually just trimmed a little bit off there and taken some profits. Foreign equity, we've remained overweight. Again, we've actually slightly reduced that overweight, uh, taking some money back and banking some of the profits that we've made. And offshore cash and property, we're neutral to marginally underweight. As I've mentioned, in terms of Africa, we've maintained our 2% weighting to that area uh, constantly. So just to end off and summarize, I think, first of all, the exchange solution funds remain a key focus area for us as the multi-manager. They're an important fund range, and we spend a lot of time and energy trying to deliver good performance. We have a 17-year track record in terms of these funds. We've made quite a few, I think, changes to the portfolio over the last 12 months. It's reduced the costs. And I certainly think it's helped uh, add to investment fund performance. We blend passive and active managers. And lastly, which is really my last slide, to remind you of all of the support material that we have in terms of the funds. So we produce a range of monthly, quarterly material, fund fact sheets, quant sheets, the pulse report that I hope that you all have registered for and get that we've had great feedback on. Quarterly, we do a more detailed uh, report on the exchange solution funds. And then, as you know, we send through things like the J.P. Lundman articles uh, on politics and economics, thought leadership articles, and hopefully also you all enjoy every two weeks our five-minute or so voice note that we send out on the markets. So that really brings me an end to my section. Hopefully that's given you a good update of the funds, a good summary of how we've been doing what changes have been made, where our focus areas have been.